in our last video, um, we left off looking at uh, this equation for heat, I'm sorry, equation for energy for the system that was based upon two different components. Okay, the amount of heat that was being given off or taken in, as well as the amount of work being done by or on the system. And we said, you know, it would be nice if we could somehow take this equation and translate it into terms that we can actually measure. Um, so in order for us to kind of wrap our brains around this, we need to consider two circumstances. The first set of circumstances is what we call a constant volume system. Okay, a constant volume system is one whose volume can't change, as the name implies. And by that, what we mean is that the walls are not flexible, they can't expand. Um, it's completely sealed vessel that has no chance for changing shape or anything. Okay, so that's a constant volume system. A constant pressure system is almost the opposite of that. Okay, so if you think about it, if you have a constant volume system and you heat it up, and if the walls can't expand, then that means the pressure is going to increase inside of that container. Okay, whereas if we had a constant pressure system, the only way that you can maintain constant pressure would be if you could change the volume of the system. Okay, so let's consider this energy equation in a constant volume system. So what I'll do is I will rewrite this as Q sub V to just remind us that that's under constant volume plus work. Now we know from our previous discussion that work equals negative P delta V. That doesn't look very neat, so let me just straighten that up real quick here. There we go. Okay, so the change in energy is equal to the Q at constant volume minus P delta V. Now we've already said that in a constant volume system that delta V has to be zero which means that this entire term goes away. Okay, so this tells us that the change in energy of the system is going to be equal to the amount of heat that's being given up or taken in. Okay, that's convenient. It's also rare. Um, there's not many cases out there, or at least not a whole lot of cases out there, um, of constant volume systems. Uh, constant pressure systems are far more likely to be uh, to be encountered. So let's look at that. Okay, so we have delta E equals Q, and we'll put a P there to remind us that it's constant pressure plus work. Okay, and then we'll do the same substitution that we did before. So delta E equals Q sub P minus P delta V. Okay, and we know that the volume can change in a uh, constant pressure system. The pressure stays the same, but that's okay. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to rearrange this equation just a little bit. Okay, and we get Q sub P is equal to the change in energy of the system. Well, I'm not going to promise I wouldn't write the system anymore, but just remember that that is the system, plus P delta V. Okay, so we can measure the amount of heat that's being given off by the system, 
And now we can relate that to the overall change in energy, as well as um, the pressure volume work that that process is exerting on the atmosphere around it. Okay, now, if you remember back in the textbook where we talked about state functions, a state function is um, a value that only depends upon the beginning and the ending points. Okay, the way that you get from the beginning to the end doesn't matter. Um, so, we said that things like volume um, and temperature were going to be state, um, sorry, uh, were going to be state functions. Okay, things like heat and work are path related. Okay, so we tend to think of them as not being state functions. But this is kind of a special case here because here we have heat and it completely depends upon state functions. Okay, so the value that we're going to use to describe this is delta H, which is what we call enthalpy. Okay, which is equal to the change in the energy of the system plus P delta V. Okay, you may also see enthalpy referred to as the heat of a reaction or heat of a reaction. Now at this point it's kind of impossible to go on um, without having some discussion about thermochemical equations. Um, thermochemical equations look just like regular chemical equations for the most part. Okay, so they have reactants, they have products, um, they have arrows, and probably even more so than in the case of regular reactions, um, thermochemical equations have the states of matter, which is actually quite a bit more important in the case of thermochemical equations. All right, so there's a couple of things, though, that there are different that we need to go through. Okay, so the first thing that we need to talk about has to do with balancing thermochemical equations. Okay, we said that when we're balancing equations, typically, um, we are only allowed to use whole number ratios. That's not necessarily the case with thermochemical equations. Okay, let's consider, for example, um, the production of water from its two constituent elements. So we have H2 in the gas phase plus O2 in the gas phase reacting to produce liquid water. Now previously when we try to balance equation, an equation like this um, we would have wound up with an answer that looks let's see like this. Okay. Now, the enthalpy for this reaction, and that's the other thing that, one other thing that thermochemical equations differ with, we always include the enthalpy of the reaction. Okay, we'll call this under standard conditions. Is five, I'm sorry, negative 571.6 kilojoules per mole. Now let's think about what that actually means. It says kilojoules per mole. Um, per mole of what? Well, per mole of reaction. Um, in every reaction, okay, there's going to be two hydrogens, one oxygen um, being consumed, and two waters being produced. Okay, so for every one mole of reactions that take place, two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen are going to be um, uh, are going to be uh, reacted and produce two moles of water. Okay, so another way of looking at this is that that there are nine. I'm sorry, negative five seventy one point six 
kilojoules of energy that are released for every two moles of H2 that gets reacted. Okay, and likewise, there's negative 571.6 kilojoules uh, released for every one mole of O2 reacted. Okay, or we can say that there are 500, I'm sorry, negative 571.6 kilojoules of energy that are released for every two moles of H2O that are being produced. Okay, so that's how we kind of look at that number. Now, that being said, I don't necessarily have to have whole number coefficients in thermochemical equations. Okay, so for example, what if I were to take this equation, so 2H2s plus O2 yielding 2H2Os as liquid and we said that the enthalpy of the reaction is equal to negative 571.6 kilojoules per mole. What if we took that whole thing and divided it by 2? Or multiply it by one half, which is the same thing. It turns out we're allowed to do that. Okay, if that's the case, we wind up with H2 plus one half of an O2 okay, yielding one molecule of water. Okay, what makes this allowable is that we also have to multiply the enthalpy of the reaction by the same value. Okay, so we wind up with the enthalpy of reaction being equal to negative 285 0.8 kilojoules per mole. Okay, and if you're worried about how this is going to pan out in terms of calculations, well, consider this. With this enthalpy of reaction, what we're saying is that there are negative 285.8 kilojoules of energy being given off for the reaction of every one mole of H2. Okay, now if you think about this, if we look at that and that, okay, aren't those two values the same? Up here, all I'm doing is I want to have to multiply, or sorry, divide that negative 571.6 by 2, and when I do that, I'm going to get the exact same value that we have down here. Okay, so we can multiply a thermochemical equation by literally any value if we wanted to, as long as we make sure that we multiply the enthalpy by the same value. Okay, a second important feature of thermochemical equations okay, is that because enthalpy is a state function, it doesn't matter if we're looking at the reaction forward or backwards. So again, we're using that same exact example that we had before. So we have H2 reacting with one half O2 and yielding one molecule of water. Okay, we said that the enthalpy for this reaction was equal to negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. Let me straighten that up a little bit. There we go. All right.
right, so this second attribute here of thermochemical equations is that we can flip a reaction around if we want to. Okay, and our reactants become our products, our products become our reactants. Okay, and when we do that, okay, the only thing that changes is the sign, not the magnitude, of the enthalpy for the reaction. Okay, and this kind of makes sense when you think about it. I mean, we're not changing the relative energies of the reactants and the products. Okay, so Okay, so if you look at this, okay, we know that the forward reaction, this first one here, okay, is an exothermic reaction because the delta H is negative. It's giving off heat. Okay, so that tells us that the products must be lower in energy. than the reactants. Okay. Now it doesn't matter if we're going forward or backwards, the energy of the products is always the energy of the products. The energy of the reactants is all the, always the energy of the reactants. Um, what's changing here is the direction. Okay, so going in the forward direction, so that's H2 and the O2 being converted to H2O. Okay, we have a negative change in energy. Okay, going in the opposite direction, we have a positive change in energy. However, the change, the actual absolute number, is the same for both. The only thing that changes is the sign. Now, in our next video, uh, we're going to take a look at how the enthalpy of a reaction can be determined experimentally um, through a technique known as calorimetry. So that'll be in the next video.